Community Wealth Building from Detroit to Ferguson. This week, we hit the road to see Tef Poe's new barbershop and more. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. I couldn't be more honored uh, or happier to be in St. Louis with Tefpo. Tef, you last saw in our reporting from Ferguson. We're here today to do a little update on what's happening around here and especially to celebrate the opening of this place. We're here at Frontline Styles Barbershop. Uh, it's a barbershop that me and my friends founded. We started, we came up with the idea during the protest about retaining some of the property, retaining some of the land, and uh, we wanted to just bring something new and unique to the community and, and have di a different type of theme with a new cutting edge, you know, beautiful barbershop for North St. Louis. Now, we have to say we're here the day before the opening. Mm -hmm. um, what will we see? What will people see here tomorrow? Okay, so tomorrow it'll be a full-fledged barbershop. We'll have the stations stocked with barbers. Uh, we'll, by then, the artwork should be on the walls. Hopefully, we'll hang that tonight. Uh, and what and kind of artwork is that going to be? We're going to do artwork that's uh, rooted in pro-blackness. We want people to be able to come here and feel good about their identity, uh, to, for this to be a safe haven for the community, a uh, place where you can learn, uh, come get your, your hair cut, you know, a refuge, you know, a place of solitude, uh, education, entertainment, all in between. So who are we gonna see on the walls? Uh, you know you gotta have Malcolm X on the wall. Uh, and you throw maybe a, a little Muhammad Ali. Uh, I'm hoping we got one of Asada. This is my guy Saul. Saul, uh, I, I met Saul in Ferguson um, when everything was going on. He used to cut a lot of our hair for free. And uh, his barbershop also became a, a safe place for the community, a place where we knew we could go, trade ideas, talk about things we wanted to do. Uh, even talk politics if we wanted to. Everything from politics to music. Growing up in the ghetto. Everybody in the city knows Saul. We know him because not only was he the barber for the movement, he was also uh, part of the movement itself out there several times when things were going on. So um, we had the idea that we wanted to do this a while ago and we just didn't have the resources to pull it together. So finally this year some things happened where we could make it a reality and here we are. Can you tell us a little bit more about what happened to make this a reality? What, what on the business side made it possible? Um, things had calmed down a little bit, like in his life, my life, he was out of town, I was still here. And I seen the opportunity, I called him and our other partner, and he said, let's go. So we made it happen. Mm -hmm. What's your vision of the work this barbershop will do in this community economically and, and, and spiritually uh, going forward? It creates jobs. The people that will come working here and the people that will see the people working here, they got a job they can take anywhere in the world with them. So they're self-sufficient. And you can make a living doing what you love to do. You know, you don't exclude people from a barbershop. So you could talk to anybody from just a 16-year-old kid in the community to uh, one of the, the elders down at the mosque to even an off-duty police officer in there who may have some different feelings about what's going on. And in the barbershop, you can get the real opinion of that person versus, you know, the opinion out in the, in the real world. So uh, a lot of nuance and crazy conversations will happen. People disagree. People agree. Um, it was, I wish they had presidential debates in, in barbershops. Wish you really a lot of luck with the opening tomorrow. Yes, ma'am. Thank yes. you. We'll spread the word. I hope you I do. So. We hope so. Thank you. With a halo and a fully loaded Mac 10 inside of his hand. Young black super sand, demon killer with a crossbow that is only the world in a trance. Floating on a brainway, living in the past. One lord tear for the villain that last with a brown skin girl from the city of the D. Double in the flesh, but I wouldn't just see. Some away, run up with a blade, running like Mario, riding on Yoshi. Fly to the princess, world on my shoulder. Never did I bring press through the first floor. All of my sins, 
Prince, Emmett Taylor, Trayvon Martin, Black Man Guys, Nigga Man March, shine like automatic light in the darkness, 16 shots, put them in the casket. So this is where I live. I, I ended up coming back to the north side after like moving away for a while. Uh, and this is where we do all our community programs at. Like this is my hood too. But it's really important that I, I, I came back over here because this is like, like gang violence dictates a lot in St. Louis. And typically somebody like myself, like you see me like, like now I'm wearing all red. Nobody else could come down this block wearing all red. My parents moved us from like this neighborhood to that neighborhood in hopes of having a better life. You know, like thinking that if we move to North County, you know, things will be okay. They'll, they'll be able to put us in better schools. You know, they'll be able to, my mom and them bought a house for the first time, even though they couldn't really afford it. And, you know, it was just an opportunity to get off Section 8 and, you know, try to do the American dream thing. So, <clears throat> but we but we had grew up with the animosity of the police in that area because that's not our neighborhood. So black people been in that neighborhood maybe 20 years at best. And white flight caused it, you know, overnight to be a black neighborhood. We moved on our block out there. Uh, it was a couple white families on the block that had been there since the 60s. By the end of the summer, the whole block was black. Ferguson, you'll still find uh, like well-to-do white people. You know, some of those houses in Ferguson you would consider mansions, and then they got the low-income apartments, which is where Mike Brown was killed at. It's just traditional racism out here. It's just classic Missouri racism. My mom kept it so real with us growing up. My mom really pre prepared us for this. It's like she knew that this was going to be rough. And my mom used to tell me all the time, she would be like, I'm so hard on you because your hardest day in my house is going to be your weakest, you know, won't compare to the, your hardest day in the world. She said, I, I, I can't be as hard on you as they're going to be on you once you leave my house. So my grandmother is the first uh, black woman to integrate the uh, workforce in this city. She got a, a good job at this factory. She had to go to work every day with the FBI. Uh, they took her to work. They escorted her to work. Uh, her brother, which is my uncle, my uncle Stan, he was a member of this, uh, basically it was like a St. Louis version of the Panthers. They used to call themselves the Liberators. My mom, my mom said she didn't know it was FBI, uh, but one day she was at an ice cream shop with the FBI agents. The person serving the ice cream told her, we're not serving you no ice cream, nigger. And this was, she was a kid. She was like, a, she said she was like six years old. She's like, that was one of those times where she was introduced to racism, like dead in her face. And then she said the FBI agent told the man behind the counter that if he didn't give her the, the, ice, the ice cream, he was going to take him to jail. So he served her. So I just grew up hearing stories like this, you know, all my life. So I lived here when Ferguson, when, when Mike Brown was killed. I was sitting on that, that front porch debating whether or not I was going to go to Ferguson. I, you know, people get killed all the time by the police, unfortunately. So it wasn't that big of a deal to us like that. And I thought it was just going to pan out to be people, you know, like just doing what people always do. They do a couple marches and go home. They pray and then they go home. I had a party to promote that night because I was home taking a break from touring. And a lot of my focus was just on that party. And then uh, my next door neighbor was the alderman at the time. And he pulled up speeding down the block like Batman and he hopped out the car and I said hey what's up man and he said uh you know I just came from Ferguson and I was like what is what's going on he said it's crazy man I'm about to tell my wife I'm about to be out there all night so uh he went in the crib and I guess had a conversation with his wife about it and then while when he said that I was like damn I kind of just knew I felt like it was a, a a call to all arms for like black St. Louis so I felt like we if you had had the capacity to be there, you was obligated to go see what the hell was going on, you know. Under the aura of capitalism, you got to do what you got to do because capitalism don't got no soul. So you, you when you when you in shit like this where people are dying every day, like this is the one of the main up strips in the city. You can go in any of these houses and get any drug you want. Uh, so many of my friends have died at this exact intersection. Like I, I drive through here all the time, just think about the different people I know that are just straight up gone and not not going to come back you know so i understand the the, the the mindset of trying to take what you have and make something with out of it so i can't knock them but for me and mine we're doing ours with no dope money we're doing ours we're doing nothing illegal we're doing ours by you know like using my mind and using my talents and 
hopefully this can start to become the new standard for a lot of these kids that are coming up. It's very important for me to be tangible and touchable for them. It's very important for me to, for them to see me and go, you know, Tef looks cool, he talks cool, he walk like I talk, he talks like I talk, he's from what I'm from. But he didn't cut himself off from us. He didn't, you know, if, if I'm gonna build something, I'm gonna build it down the street from where I used to do my dirt, you know, so that the same kids could come out there and see like, yo, it, you can be something from these from this terrain. You can, you can think differently. You can be different. You can, you don't have to go according to the same rigmarole and f- go according to the flow of things. You can break away. You can deviate from the path and use your mind to say, hey, what happens if we do something different? And I think that's important because all too often, the only way we try to politicize black youth is by telling them to vote. Like that's the only thing we got for black youth is voting. So. I think it's absolutely insane for us to constantly, 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 constantly show up at the doorstep of these young people. And the first thing we want to put in their hands is a voter registration card. Because on the flip side to that is these streets, the first thing they're going to put in their hands is some dope, some money, some food, a pistol. And in and, and, and this terrain, that's opportunity. That's, that's opportunity for me to make some shake. So that voter registration card is just a piece of paper for me to vote some stale, corny, uh, you know, already wealthy, 1%-ass white man back in the office, and we ain't going to see no results from none of that. And I think voting is necessary, but I also think that it's necessary for us to teach these kids to use their imaginations. It's a lot of, for the young people, it's the art. It really is the music. That's why so many people here are rappers. That's why so many people here trying to be artists and singers and painters and uh, I think the slep on story about us is our art our arts community St. Louis has produced like some of some great artists some great music great great thinkers Maya Angelou is from here uh Tina Turner is from here Miles Davis is from East St. Louis Chuck Berry, Chuck Berry you know inventor of rock and roll he's from here uh the blues music you know different variations of the blues were created here uh so like we have an attachment to that history And a lot of us uh, are very gung-ho about uplifting that history and not separating ourselves from that. And I think that's what the the power, that's where the power is in it it for us. We do have a chance to define ourselves and define our own destiny. My name is Salem Green. I am a uh, writer and a poet, and I work with the Black Belt Citizens doing contract work around literary healing and a women's coordinator. Well, Uniontown is a small um, community in the Black Belt of Alabama, maybe 14 to 1,500 people, um, marginalized minority community that have been um, impacted by environmental injustice through a coal ash as well as water sewage issues as a result of factory emissions from a cheese plant factory. There's also political uh, previous attempts at voter fraud as well. Well, the Black Belt in Alabama, the Black Belt spans from Georgia to Mississippi, some parts of the Carolinas as well. But the Black Belt of Alabama has 12 counties that represent um, some of the most rural areas of Alabama. Most of those areas are poverty stricken, but um, the Black Belt um, talks about the particular soil, the black soil that's in that particular area. When in the past there have been some people who have talked about their thoughts around people buying votes, um, people being paid for their bo- their votes as well. Also, some an activity at local elections that were not in tangent with the rules of politics and political uh, affirmations of what they were supposed to be doing. The Black Belt Citizens Organization um, is an organization that fights for health and justice in the community, and the officers and the leadership have impacted. Uh, the community to fight for their own economic development as well as justice around voting as well. And one of the wonderful things is that during our last election for um, 
district commissioner, we had our vice president, Ben Eaton, who ran for uh, commissioner for his district five and he won. This is a huge, huge um, impact towards the community. But to get us there, we had teams of women that were coordinated through Black um, Voters Matter, which is a national organization out of Washington, D.C., uh, founded by Latasha Brown. And this particular network gives, gave an opportunity not just for the Black Belt in Uniontown, but the entire nation, but particularly Alabama. I got a chance to work alongside Latasha, the Black Belt Citizens, a Black Belt Citizens President, Esther Calhoun, and women community leaders in Uniontown to go around the entire community for three weeks and canvas the community, talk about voter education, to do a really robust voter education campaign that included talking door to door neighborhood to neighborhood, business to business, with people in the community about who were voting, about their voter rights, and knowing their voters' rights, and also supporting um, individuals particularly who needed to get registered to vote or maybe also had some issues in the past that they needed to rectify. So we brought people in to support them in those areas. And as a result, um, we saw a huge win, and we saw a huge um, outpouring of people who were going to vote. In District 5, which is the um, Ben Eaton's district, the district he won in, he won by 33 votes. You're talking about a, a town that is 1,900 people. In his district, um, I think it was maybe 432 to 427, not good with the numbers, but it was um, by 33 votes. So over 800 people in one district in um, Perry County came out to actually voice their vote. And I think it was hugely as a result of the Black Voters Matter campaign, the Black Belt Citizens coordinating and collaborating in partnership with women and youth teams to go out and do voter education throughout the community and having that capacity and having that partnership to do that, but also having the leadership through Black Belt Citizens, Black Voters Matter, Latasha Brown, and the women of the community and the energy and the spirit of the youth of the community to do that is what really brought people to the polls educating people to, about what their rights were, and then also giving them tools to rectify any um, situations that, that they had. So we're really excited about what this means for Uniontown, but Perry County and the Black Belt. So I think this shows that people are interested in voting, they're interested in voter education, but they're also interested in organizing and canvassing and going door to door and doing some of those very, very day-to-day -day things that's going to make the entire difference. What got, has gotten lost to the people what has gotten lost is what happens when people who are already in poverty, who already have a multitude of other um, injustice issues that are crowded the area, what happens when you now bring in climate adaptation? Now what happens when you are looking at ways in how you can help educate the community that this is a part of, this needs to be part of the climate communication, a part of the climate talks parts of what the broader scheme of what people are saying. So I think now is a very unique and exciting time. The NAACP has made great efforts in talking about uh, people of color and climate adaptation and climate change. And we recently had Jackie Patterson, who is the Executive Director of Climate um, Change for the NAACP, come down and talk with our women during a healing circle that I lead in the community to talk about how do we now say those words, what do those words mean, and how are we communicating that to other people as they are listening to this whole dialogue around what's happening in Uniontown. And beyond that, the great spirit of Uniontown and the Black Belt and other areas that have been impacted and, women, and people of color have been impacted by climate adaptation and climate issues is that they are finding their own solutions. They are culminating and cultivating their own partnerships they are bringing people in to help support healing practices and also helping to support contemporary ceremonies around the land and around land justice and around the assets that we already have as far as women who own property, women who are looking to own more property, and then how we can now look at environmentally what it is that we need so that not only we can address these issues, but we can communicate about it a little bit more effectively on the grand scale. I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to the Oakland Avenue Urban Farm, which is located in the North End uh, community of Detroit. This farm has been in existence since 2008. 
and it's centered around food production, which is cultivating food, workforce development, which is cultivating people, and community development, which is cultivating community. I am Bryce Detroit, uh, representing Center for Community-Based Enterprise. We are a grassroots nonprofit organization in the city of Detroit that focuses on helping groups of people come together to investigate and create worker ownership as a solution to the specific socioeconomic circumstances in Detroit. Here's the deal. We have a, we have a commercial district that is void of any service, any retail that the community has access to. Anything that we want, we are going outside of the community to buy. Even if it's um, toilet paper, <laughs> something as basic as that. You cannot buy it within the community. You have to go across what, what, which is not within the community. That takes money, resources out of our community. That's a job that's not in our community. So we started our work in 2008 based on a need that the organization had to identify what was going on in the community. What we discovered is that the biggest needs were food, housing, and jobs. And it just so happened that on Oakland, between the church and the Reds Jazz Shoe Shop, there were 10 vacant lots. And the church had been managing those lots for about 15, 20 years. We looked at it as an opportunity and started engaging people in the, in the community to talk about what they would like to see um, happen on those lots. And so, um, of course, food was something that was easy to do. And so we started working with um, an organization who had some resources at that time, and it was Greening of Detroit. Being an African-American um, community, culturally appropriate, it was beans, greens, and tomatoes, basically, and some squashes. So that's what we did um, the first couple of years is uh, build that garden out and cr start creating a space where people felt uh, connected to and they wanted to see something beautiful on Oakland. In addition to like food, clothing and shelter, we do have other needs that arise just from our point of culture and ancestry. Uh, so the need to be intimately connected with land, for instance. Um, not just on a, yes, we traverse <laughs> the urban landscape, but actually on a, I have an identity that has a reverence for land and appreciates land as a thing that actually can produce everything that we need. So to me, the farm represents that type of legacy, this legacy that is 100% attached to ancestral culture where we are self-determined and the work that we produce, we're self-determined in designing our environments, as well as we're self-determined in creating economic infrastructure to support ourself plus our village as we see it. Many of our folks are returning citizens, but we then we're now able, we've been now able to reach out into community uh, to provide jobs for youth and other members of our community who not, might not necessarily have a blemish on their record, but they're still looked at as being unemployable. This place has become kind of like a safe haven for people. Uh, once they come and spend time with us, it's contagious. They don't want to leave. It's like, this is the place to be. We had to demonstrate that we have not only the capacity uh, to purchase, but also the capacity to manage properties. And so in doing that, we've been able to each year go back and buy a block of, of properties, nine uh, at a time. Um, and so we've done that for the last three years. We're over 30 lots and 30 properties. Uh, we just, that's huge. We never wanted to be that, that group. But I think it's in divine order because our purpose is not selfish. Our purpose is really trying to protect the power of the people who live here, trying to protect the commons. And so it is our goal, and um, hopefully with the help of C2BE and you know, some of the um, um, 
lawyers that we are working with from the Great Lakes Environmental Center, we can figure out how to transfer this ownership back to the community via a land trust into perpetuity so that the, the community has to say in terms of what happens with these properties. There is a significant amount of time that we feel is necessary in this time of transition. Like we're transitioning from straight providing service for the love to realizing that, that to provide this service, it must have a sustainable infrastructure. So transitioning into being able to develop these infrastructures, which means transitioning from points of identity that we used to have into these new points of identity, which will allow us to be the directors, the captains and custodians of these new sustainable entities. Now I gotta tell you, within the last two weeks, we had an ice cream shop open. It is so exciting. It's open and people are going, people are driving down the street. I was standing, I went to visit uh, Tuesday to get ice cream and I was standing out in front of the uh, cafe, the, the dairy, talking with the owner, and a car drove by and they shouted out the window, is that black owned? Is this a black owned business? And we were like, yeah, they made a U-turn, okay? And came back to buy ice cream. They had five kids in the car. So there is a need, there is a desire, and people know what they would like to see happen.